We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I'm very excited to welcome our next guest on the interview series, Ari Luna. She is the Human Resources Director at Trans Lifeline. Ari, so good to see you. If you want to share a little bit about yourself, uh, for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly we answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Ari, um, she, her pronouns. I'm super happy to be here. And I think um, what I wanted to be when I grow up, I think I, I struggle a little bit with this one because um, the answer always changed, but I think I really wanted to be, um, just like happy and free. And I know it sounds like kind of a, not like a traditional sort of like career answer, but um, I always just knew that I wanted to like do what I wanted, like when I wanted, like how I wanted. Um, so that's definitely what I always wanted to be, still do. There you go. I love that. I think those are great, great goals to have as well. Fast forward to today um, in terms of career pathing, how do you think your professional journey, your personal journey has really led you to this point in your career as human resources director at Trans Lifeline? Yeah, it's a good question. I um, I think that my, my sort of trajectory, so I went to, I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a degree in social work. Um, and I sort of always knew that I wanted to do sort of more systematic, like um, macro level work as opposed to direct service work. Um, and sort of got involved with nonprofits and was doing some direct service work and then didn't really feel like it was the right fit for me, but was able to realize that like operations and HR and things like that felt um, like a better fit where I could sort of also, where I could really bridge the gap between like um, working, working with folks and supporting them, also building capacity for people and ensuring their needs are met um, while still doing that sort of like systemized, systematic work of um, building infrastructure and creating, like working with logistics and policies to to enhance people's experiences. And so I think it sort of became this blend of where um, if I'm doing it right, like that I'm um, yeah in service of other folks. Yes, that definitely makes sense. And I'm sure creating the systemic change, the infrastructure, making sure people have the resources to thrive is there's never a dull day that goes by. What would you say is one of the current problems you're trying to solve? Yeah, I think one of the current problems that I'm trying to solve is we, as so Trans Lifeline is an organization like by trans folks, for trans folks, and we have a lot of staff members come from like all kinds of different places, right? And I think like, as we know, like life happens to all of us at different points in time and people don't always have the resources 100% um, of the time to take care of what comes up. Um, and I think that I want to position our organization to be more equipped to deal with those situations as they arise. Um, I think that it is very hard for folks like us to get the care and Resources that, resources that we need like out in the world. And so um, if this is an org for us, by us, why not also have it like take care of us and make sure that, you know, we are, folks have what they need. And so I think that looks like I've been able to partner with um, Elliot from the Transgender Law Center who I deeply, deeply appreciate. Um, and they have been able to share like some resources in terms of, um, like operating from a place of abundance rather than like scarcity. And so really, really thinking through like what, you know, what policies can we put into place, whether that's like an emergency assistance fund for employees or like short-term disability or other types of insurance that we can offer. Um, and, you know, really connect those dots and make sure that if we, if we map that out well enough, that like if something happens, there's like a policy in play that will cover somebody and make them, make sure that they have what they need uh, to get through it. Yeah, being really proactive, partnering with other organizations and really thinking about the holistic employee experience in terms of benefits, insurance. And I know we talked about a bunch of other projects as well. And I know you shared that your goal isn't just to make sure that people are, you know, they're doing good, but you want to make sure that 
the goal of the organization is to ensure all staff are really thriving. I love that word. Can you provide an example of what that really looks like in practice for folks who are listening? Yeah, I think that means like, so, I mean, I think there's a lot of steps to get there, right? I think that like, there's definitely pieces of like listening and having staff feel safe and like they have agency in that their participation and like in the processes that play involve consent, like that they are um, playing an active role in what they're deciding to be a part of. Um, I think that it looks like um, comprehensive benefits. I think it looks like pay that is um, not just like at market rate value, but like really setting the trends. I think it looks like time off policies that are generous. I think it means really shifting the narrative around um, how some of these some of these policies work and operate and making them just more accessible and easy for folks to take part in um, and like really you know not just having like FMLA as like standardized by like um, government entities but like really taking that and saying like how can we make this better and like just more straightforward and same thing with like parental leave and like bereavement leave and like all those things and like really allowing folks to um, have the capacity to like live a full life. Like I want folks to come to work and know that like, while this is a job and like while we still exist in capitalism, this place has my back and like this place um, is paying me like a, a rate that I am like worth. And this, this place is making sure that I have the resources in my life that I need to feel taken care of. Um, and yeah, I think those are some of the key elements for me in terms of um what thriving looks like yeah that phrase of this place has my back this place recognizes that i wear many roles in addition to the job that i currently have and i take the work really seriously but also there are so many things going on as well there's a lot happening in the world in each person's individual life people are at different stages of their lives and careers as as you mentioned as well how are you thinking about how is trans lifeline thinking about not perpetuating that trauma that happens externally in the world, um, internally at the organization, at a company level, uh, knowing that companies and employers are kind of microcosms of society and the communities that they're in. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I think, I think this is something that we haven't always been good at to be like totally candid. Um, I think this is something that we are learning um, daily. I think that we have a lot of work left to do in this regard, but I think that we are, are, yeah, starting with a place of just like really doing our due diligence and making sure that we are, I think as a leadership team, right? Like really focusing in on um, what are like concrete ways that we can, we can make changes that like staff wanna see and that will benefit them and subvert those sort of societal like those, those like forms of oppression, right? And um, if that means bringing in contractors, if that means like holding town halls for staff members, like we wanna do those things and we wanna do them well. And I think that we are committed to, to that work. And I think that it's hard work. I think it is long work. I think that um, folks often just like, it's easy to just like talk about. It's easy to just like bring it up and have a meeting and like talk about it and like nothing comes of it. Um, and so that's what we want to not do. We're gonna take like material action the best that we can within the confines of like labor laws and all those things and like make sure that we are um, both maintaining the self, like the sustainability of our organization but also the, the well-being of our staff. Um, so yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a hard balance but I think it's more than just like having um, just like pretty standard. I don't know, I have like a, I have some like qualms about like traditional DEI work. I think it like replicates a lot of the same systems that you were just talking about. And I like really want to push folks to go beyond that. And like, if, if folks aren't walking away from those spaces feeling like more powerful and like more capable and like more autonomous, then I don't think that we're doing it correctly. Um, and so I think those are the goals that we're striving for. Absolutely. I was just talking to someone the other day about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging work at private organizations as well, and making sure we're not replicating like that Western lens, we're not replicating kind of the harm that's done outside of 
get this work as well. And I do wanna uh, drive in on the concrete changes. It sounds like they're getting feedback from people, trying different initiatives and really making sure that people feel seen, heard and understood at Trans Lifeline. We know that um, over the past few years, a lot of organizations have been consistently auditing their systems and processes um, and making them more equitable. We could always be doing better. How are you kind of designing systems to be really equitable or have there been any changes that you uh, have made recently or over the past few years that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think some of the stuff that's come up over the past few years has been, um, so before I, before I was brought on to Trans Lifeline, before I joined, um, there were, there was sort of an initiative by um, staff members, like specifically BIPOC staff members to um, present like a series of 36 steps that the organization could take to address like anti-Blackness to the organization. Um, and I think that we, we spent some time working on some of those policies, um, which included like more equitable pay for folks. Um, it included uh, just like more, like a better sort of more thoughtful approach to like hiring and hiring practices. Um, and some of those things we were able to accomplish, some of them we weren't, we've like lost some sort of, we've like sort of redirected a little bit from that, the proposal initially to other sort of equity work with consultants, but I think it's always something that's like in the back of my mind, because, you know, addressing anti-Blackness is something that should be at the forefront of every organization, um, personally, like addressing white supremacy as well, and um, I think that we some things that we're trying to do right now would be that we are working on um, like restructuring our budgeting process to be more um, like more um, informative for staff members to like so that way they can play a more active role in what the budgeting looks like for the next year, um, they can have more agency over like doing professional development type ins, like the money that goes into the department, um, but really making sure that folks are like informed and equipped to like do that work. Um, and we're also trying to take it a step further and work with some, some consultants as well to really bring in some perspectives that would help us rethink like, because currently folks can get involved like through their manager, but like how do we get folks more directly involved while maintaining like um, appropriate like uh, decision-making structures that like make, let people know like what it is that you have control over so that way we're not telling people one thing and doing another thing and there's just miscommunication about it. And so really wanted to do that. Um, we've really we've really worked on a couple, myself and the rest of, and um, our HR team and our HR administrator all have like really worked on some, creating some policies that have, that I think um, sort of, yeah, push the, push the boundaries of like what certain like things look like, like our brief leave policy that we rolled out not too long ago um, which didn't exist prior, um, provides folks up to like 10 days at a time um, per loss. Um, if they have more than like two, lo two losses in a, in a year, they can talk to somebody at the organization about getting more time, but it allows them to take those days like non-sequentially. So if they, if they wanna take time for like a memorial one day and like, or viewing one day and like take some time later to go visit um, or however they wanna take it, um, they can break it up however they would like to. So just creating like flexibility there. Um, and then offhand, I think we also um, are really working to flush out some of our like um, support for folks on like healthcare and health insurance and um, providing like stipends to folks if there are delays in healthcare and things like that. And so I think those are some of the pieces that we've, we've worked on recently that feel, that feel good to have and important to have um, because it not only like offers resources to staff, but also offers them protections too in, in terms of like a document that they can reference that the whole organization can see that is a policy that we have. And so very appreciative of those. Yeah, I appreciate those examples of how you're pushing the, the boundaries there, pushing the envelope, being more progressive in policies and systems and processes. Fortunately for your organization and unfortunately for other organizations, that is the longest bereavement period I have I've heard people offer and that flexibility piece is really important. So I hope that others really um, adopt that as a best practice as well and really think about, you know, changing their systems to be more equitable in terms of human resources as a function. I know from talking to folks who are in this space or when they hear human resources, sometimes they think of 
the principal's office or another stereotype around the, the industry? How are you really breaking these stereotypes around human resources and people and building trust at your organization? I think it's I think it's another sort of like slow work moment where um, folks really have to see you doing the things that you say that you're gonna do and just sort of leaning into that discomfort of like if folks are distrustful, like there's a reason for that. Um, and so really, really showing up fully and just like letting folks be themselves. I think it means having good boundaries. I don't think of myself as somebody who is um, able to like hold every like every feeling for every person that comes up like that's not my role and but like and I'm able to communicate that to folks to be like here's what I am able to offer like these are the things that we have um, I think it looks like just being yeah just being present and open to like people and responsive to people's needs I think so often um, people look at like policies and compliance and say this you know we can't we can't help you because this policy says that we can't help you as opposed to like okay this policy says this thing but also like as the hr director i can like change that policy that is like within my power to do right so that's not like a good reason not to help you <laughs> um so like let's you know how do we make this policy work for you and for other people because i'm sure you're not the only person that needs this if if you're needing this and so um I think just really showing up and doing that work. And um, I think that our role as HR is to support folks in in a way that is almost like um, as close to mutual aid as makes sense. Like, you know, we're getting paid for this and it's like a job and that sort of thing. But um, I think we really need to push the boundaries in terms of these like capitalist structures that teach us that like HR exists to to only protect the company. And while I think that's a role that HR has, like our role should be to these staff members, like first and foremost, if we're not looking out for them, like who is? Um, and like all that to say, like, I think, and, well, I guess the other answer to that is like unions also look out for staff members and like, I fully support that. Um, but like, if, you know, I think, I think it's a yes and situation or like, yes, people should have their, should organize to protect their rights and HR should also be present to make sure that like, that to make that fight less hard. <laughs> like um, it should not be an uphill battle to like get a policy to change if it's not working for staff members. Like I can, I can do that. And so I'm happy to do that. Yeah, really showing up for people, investing in the time and really reframe that to say, okay, how can we work together to create a better policy? And also you're right, if one person has a question or someone comes to you and asks if this could be changed, it'll benefit everybody as well um, and people that come into the organization too so I think it is a a win-win for everyone and using that framework of mutual aid and really thinking about um, how you can show up for people is important um, along the same lines you mentioned uh, in our previous conversation how you really partner with organizations uh, who have not historically partnered together to really build a great place to work with total benefits such as compassionate leave, a longer bereavement period as you shared and more. Um, how are you partnering with folks and how do you determine who to, to partner with? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm like super down to partner with anybody who is willing to rethink what HR looks like. I think as long as somebody is open to saying like, what is, what is like a radical approach to HR look like or what is like an equitable approach to HR look like? Um, that I'm super, I would love to have a conversation with, with anybody who's on that page. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to connect with, um, like I mentioned, Elliot from the Transgender Law Center, um, and then also like Emily from uh, the National Network for Abortion Funds. And we've been able to have some meetings and um, share some resources and share some policies around like compensation structures, around um, like I like I mentioned before Elliot's document on like the an abundance model for supporting staff members. Um, Elliot and I usually try to check in like once a week or like once every other week just so we can touch base on um, different different happenings at our organization, like how we can support each other. Um, we also talk a lot about uh, we've been working towards like having like a peer sort of um, peer mentor approach where like we're also we're both peer coaching each other and really able to offer feedback and talk through tough situations and things like that. And so 
really, really taking a look and saying like, um, rewinding a little bit, I like, I'm able to work with some fantastic folks here in Austin. And um, one of one of those groups is Embody Transform, which features Andrea Black and Paula Riojas and Kelly Coleman. And um, they have this philosophy of like that, that um, you know, expertise is created by your your sort of experience, like your sort of like knowledge and work history and all that stuff, but also like your lived experiences and bringing those two things together and really creating this blend of of a wealth of knowledge and um, you know, I think and I think that I I think that we're able to bring that to each other um, when we're sitting down at this table and saying like you know we are all most of us in this conversation have some sort of marginalized identity like we're able to take into that into account and say like how would this world be better for me if these things were in place and then try to implement those things for other folks and um, I think that's the that's the key is that I think so often some of this work comes from folks who don't walk in the world in the same way or like come from really um, privileged positions, which if you're doing good work, that's fine. But like, I think um, I think that so much is missed because they're not including folks who have those lived experiences in the conversation um, or let alone with like any agency or decision-making power. Um, and so like, I really challenge folks to like, um, yeah, partner with other people and like take a step back and be like, how much, you know, how much do I need to bring to this conversation? How much do I need to listen? And like, really, really challenge that sort of internal dialogue of like, it has to be about me or something. And like really focus like what other folks are bringing. Absolutely. There's something to be said for knowledge sharing, really leaning on the community, having conversations about um, how we can push this work forward together. And there are a lot of people out there doing great work as well to connect with. And I'm sure that a lot of folks reach out to you throughout the year to partner together. I've seen a lot of uh, companies really try to partner with organizations to celebrate and honor Pride, which is in June uh, every year. And we know that it's important to really support um, and honor LGBTQIA plus employees 365 days a year. Um, from your perspective, how would you want to see employers really authentically honor and celebrate Pride while also you know, supporting employees year round? Yeah, so the first part of that question of like, how do I want folks to, I'm gonna go to the second part first. So I think how to support your folks year round. I think that looks like concrete policies that like protect, um, like if we're talking about like queer folks and trans folks in particular, I think like, you know, having policies that protect those folks and um, really having comprehensive training for folks who work in HR. Um, like if, if somebody is coming to HR and being like, I've been, you know, consistently misgendered by this person or by these, this team or at this, at this company and that person's response is like, what does that even mean? Like, I think like, there's like a real gap there in terms of like what that company is able to offer those folks. Um, I think that, yeah, there's a lot of like, I think that there's a lot of, there's not much thought around, um, you know, what, what benefits like trans folks in particular need, um, like is, you know, is a company's healthcare policy, like is there, is there insurance like trans inclusive, does it include surgery, does it include like hormone therapy, does it include like the things that folks need? Um, I think there's also like, we have, you know, we have a, we have a bereavement leave policy, but I think um, part of the reason for that is because we understand like um, so much of our community is like chosen family. Like a lot of folks just don't touch their bio families and that's incredible, but like a lot of our community is like chosen family and um, trans folks and queer folks have higher rates of experiencing violence or, um, you know, experiencing suicide and things like that. And I think if we're not understanding those things, we can't build and craft policies that really offer time and space and care to the people that need those things. And um, I think that there's also not enough understanding of, of trans people beyond um, just like the, the 
the bad stuff like you know like what is what does trans joy look like what is it what does gender euphoria look like for folks like what do we how do we incorporate elements of like of of like lived of like living joy in this organization for this person like how do we make sure that they feel included in a part of this company and um i think those are all things that just take a little bit of extra thought to to sit down with and say um you know we want to we want to have those things for you because you're important here and like you matter um but i think in terms of pride like i i think that there i know this might, this might be a hot take so i apologize in advance if this is a super hot take but I like appreciate pride. I think it's great. I like, I also think that there are, I don't know, it's been very commercialized and like, um, I don't know, we take it back to our roots. And I think that there are certain things that like um, companies do. Like, I think that there's there's value in saying like who, who we are going to like partner with for pride. Um, because so often like people will partner with um, other organizations or maybe even themselves and they have like atrocious policies or like right. procedures for like for trans or queer folks and like mm -hmm. it's not it's like if you're not doing the work how are you celebrating the thing um and then I think like there's other aspects of it too of like um of you know of like who who harms trans folks and queer folks and I think like some companies donate money to like different places like um like organizations or even like police departments and I think like really sitting back and being like if we're if we're truly about like liberation of like queer and trans folks and like the autonomy of queer and trans folks, like we have to divest and work towards abolishing these institutions that like harm us. Um, and so I think my challenge is like really sitting down and being like, where's your money going? Where are your what are your policies doing? And like who are you supporting? Because if those things aren't like in alignment, then like you can't possibly be like in alignment with your staff. Would be my suggestion. Absolutely. I think that definitely makes sense in terms of looking at that alignment, really looking at what you're doing 365 days a year in terms of supporting your folks and really looking at that authentic commitment to understanding the community and say, okay, what can I do from um, a leadership perspective? What can I do from a systemic company level to really create that uh, support system and make more space? Are there any other common mistakes, Ari, that you see companies making and their human resources strategy today. Of course, you don't have to name any names, uh, but what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think that I have seen folks like one of the one of the most common, like one of the just like the easiest to touch on and easiest to change is just like folks require requiring like legal names and dead names for applications and things like that. Um, when it doesn't have to be that way at all. Like if you, you know, they're we do need like legal names for like for like government forms and like you know your w2 and like your payroll and, all, and your insurance and all that stuff but like we don't have to have that like on the application section we can get that from you later um in like a more thoughtful like caring way um but i think i think yeah i just i think the biggest mistake that i see probably is just like folks aren't thinking about it because it doesn't really matter to them and when they are thinking about it it's it's often very like reactionary like something something has happened at the company like and now they're just like we have to get this program going because we're in trouble like um but i think really sitting down and being like how do we center like our queer staff our trans staff our bipoc staff like our 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 staff for like women like um how do we how do we really serve these folks in a way that is supportive and that they need um and so i think yeah i think i think intentionality is honestly the biggest like sort of oversight that i see um is that folks aren't very intentional with their approach to working with folks you have to be intentional you have to be proactive and really think about the experience that you are really curating for potential candidates and for current employees even if it doesn't seem like if you don't have that experience, you just think about who am I leaving out of the conversation and really, again, look at auditing your processes as well, bring other people into the conversation. Um, I'm sure you have many of these, but what is your one, uh, one of uh, your proudest moments at Trans Lifeline? One of my proudest moments at Trans Lifeline? Um, yeah, there are lots of really lovely moments. Um, 
I I want to say so my I might give two examples if that's okay. Yeah. Um, my I think my proudest moment was really working with um, our finance and operations director Bunny um, to really rework our compensation structure and being able to provide folks something that was much more in alignment with like a a livable wage. Like we're working towards thriving right now, you know, currently, um, and we're getting closer and closer. But like really wanting to like have a more equitable salary structure and like taking the first steps toward that after so much inaction for like a long period of time. Um, not not because you know it was intentional, but just resources and capacity and things. And so that felt really incredible to be able to provide to know that how important that is. Um, and I think the other um, moment that like sort of made me really proud or excited slash feel good was that we we sort of had like a, a really hard staff meeting or like some really hard moments leading up to a moment when we were talking about our new upcoming like permanent leadership model and folks sort of came to the table and sort of without talking about it sort of agreed that like a co-leadership model was was a good approach for us potentially um but it was it was just this realization that I have like I've had more than once for sure and like always keeps me going through like the hard days but um it was just this realization that like our organization is built and like supported by so many incredible folks many of whom are trans who like are just some of the most brilliant and like thoughtful people that I could ever have the pleasure to work with. And I yeah. think that they really bring this like life and spirit and creativity to this work that um, I feel, I just feel so nourished by. And so I, um, every day I'm just blown away by my team. And so I think um, that's definitely like another moment that I was like, this is really incredible. And I'm really, really excited that I'm here. I love that answer. What an incredible gift to feel nourished by your team and feel like you are working with people you can learn from and also you are supported by as well. Um, Ari, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to share with folks who are listening or maybe underscoring a couple key takeaways for folks to really bring with them around anything we discussed from intentionality to your journey to Trans Lifeline and how you're making that systemic change? Um, I guess just like a final reminder and like moment of gratitude for like all the folks who do this work and how um, important this work is. And I think if we're doing it well, we have the really ability to impact people and um, the world is hard out there. Yep. <laughs> I think we have the capacity to make it a lot less hard at our places of employment. And so I think we have responsibility to do that. Absolutely. I, I think that is really important to remember. Ari, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, and as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood. And now it's a requirement for the, te the team and the company to succeed overall. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. Mm -hmm.